Hello everyone, thank you for clicking on this video. This is Sean Weathers, and I am The Cinephile. A pivotal objective of this Cinephile series is to cultivate a profound appreciation among emerging film enthusiasts by illuminating the historical significance, artistic merit, and sheer entertainment value inherent in cinematic predecessors. While undoubtedly celebrating the contemporary luminaries of our time, it remains imperative and steadfast to uphold the legacy of past cinematic visionaries. Numerous videos featured on this channel have delved into discussions led by myself and other esteemed individuals on the illustrious legacy of the pioneering auteur filmmaker Sam Peckinpah. Today, I'm privileged to present an interview with Peckinpah himself, allowing viewers to glean insights directly from the esteemed filmmaker's own perspective. Sam Peckinpah is the man at the very center of the endless debate about the nature and effect of violence in the cinema. He is, to be sure, one of the very few film directors with a strong claim to be called an artist. But this fact tends to be generally overlooked because most people associate him with the excesses of the Wild Bunch, a film which began and ended with a massacre, a welter of blood and death in slow motion, and Straw Dogs, an everyday story of country folk, which was set in Cornwall and included so much rape, murder and bloody revenge that a number of highly respected British film critics were outraged enough to write a letter of protest to the Times. The lyrical qualities of Peckinpah's films, especially in a picture like The Ballad of Cable Hogue, are often forgotten, and it's the violence that's remembered, the kind of violence that he showed most recently in Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. right here but you're gonna have to take it oh well, we're gonna have to take it i see i see well thank you very much just gracious well we found it it's right here we're gonna have to make our move now Mr. Peckinpah, let's uh, start with one of the more controversial areas surrounding you. Uh, Does one it... of the most controversial areas surrounding me is the fact that uh, there are three people in the world who call me Mr. Peckinpah. They are all lawyers for MGM. Sam, may we start with one of the more controversial areas around you, and that is, does it worry you that in the public mind your work is synonymous with excessive and very explicit violence that you are in fact known as bloody sam no people who uh could take their own leisure at deciding what they did not want to do for a living and apply labels to others journalists tv commentators etc uh, did that some years ago, and of course the public uh, went for these labels. I think the public has learned, or at least somebody has learned in the passing years, that uh, Bloody Sam was merely a changeover from dishonesty to at least looking at the fact that people do bleed and are hurt. But I am not responsible for the chainsaw, whatever its name is, or any of the other trash that has been put forth. Ideal and violence is a term of very sad poetry. Do you think it's not possible that, um, that you haven't made that specific enough in, in your films? Isn't it possible that people watching violence perpetrated by attractive people can then find that violence itself seems attractive? 
Isn't there this danger with, with the kind of films you tackle? Well, let's look at the facts. The facts are that most violent crimes are committed by members of the family or close friends. The most violent deaths are involved with people involved with each other. I think that uh, in dissecting violence, then we must find out where our aggression can be channeled except to the people we love. And we both know that love and hate are very closely entwined. I have not reached the point that I can uh, say, as Freud and others did, uh, this is this. I only have questions. You don't provide the answers. but um... No, who does? Well, I don't know. I wonder if it's not the responsibility well, of the Well, I said one time in a film called Straw Dogs, there's no history in the world of anybody except that of Christ, which has provided more violence under his name. And his name is Peace. And why are people killing still under his name? I think this is anachronism. I think it is ridiculous. But the, surely the... The effect your film can have on, on the cinema audiences can be dangerous, surely, because there was, wasn't there not a case in the Nigerian Civil War when some of the soldiers watched The Wild Bunch and were so excited by it, they started shooting and going out and saying they wanted to die like William Holden, in fact, creating mayhem. Does that worry you that that yes, could have happened? Yes, it does very much, and uh, I have to preface this with the fact that this was a French correspondent speaking honestly on what he'd seen I made the wild bunch because I still believed in the Greek theory of catharsis that by seeing this we would be purged by pity and fear and get this out of our system I was wrong if you've noticed most of my films are now an increasing level of violence bit by bit and must take it away because it does no good I was wrong they did that. They were they really attacking. Did, soldiers. Yes, they really did, and they were attacking for me for all the wrong reasons, and I stand corrected, and I am sick in my heart because of that. If one instance like that happened, uh, it makes, it destroys what I was trying to do. Catharsis only works in certain, as Theodore Lips once said, it depends upon the viewer and his situation and the artist and uh, it was a total failure I will not make again but you, you haven't actually excluded violence from your film since then have you I mean, there's a fair amount in, in say Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid for instance or bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia uh, it's two uh, things and you're speaking uh, you know with the Spanish uh, Garcia is only in Spain uh, Garcia <laughs> rather good. Uh, absolutely belongs to Mexico and the Tex-Mex and New Mexico border there is no way that you can take a legend which is based on fact and fiction and dreams and not show at least part of what happened between Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid unfortunately the beginning and the end of the picture and the middle were cut out so there was no frame of reference. Alfredo was a personal statement about Mexico, about the people I knew, and that stands as it is. I have no apologies, and uh, I cannot justify it. As a filmmaker, I must look at both sides of the coin and do my best as a storyteller. Uh, I have no absolutes. I have no value judgment. All I know is that a lot of people that my people came from are dying in County Tyrone. Why? And they're dying in Jerusalem and they're dying all over. Why? Why? Why does violence have such a point of intoxication? People. Why do people structure their day on killing? Well, if it has a point of intoxication, isn't it rather a dangerous thing to play within the cinema? I don't make rules. 
I think it's more dangerous to watch them do it in the news. I cannot compete with the news. What about this this bandwagon that um, that you have started oh, willy nilly? I mean, I'm sure you you probably regret it as much as anybody else. But films have become increasingly violent over the last few years. Um, and indeed, there's one now called Death Weekend, which is being advertised on commercial radio with a slogan that it makes straw dogs look weak, I think is the phrase. What do you, um, I mean, how do, how do you feel about that? Bored. <laughs> totally? Totally bored. <laughs> Don't love the film, couldn't care less. Uh, I deal enough with exploitation films and exploitation people and um, I don't, I try not to waste my time with it. So I think you're going to have to take the good. cap off there, actually, yes, before you can get the coffee off. off. I do have one, but it's made of plastic, which works much better, but not as hot. Oh, God, that is very good coffee. It has been said in your films that there's no diagnosis or cure offered in your films, that you merely take what you regard as society's ills and show them as they are. Is it not part of a, a film director's responsibility to go further than that? Well, Marlon Brando once said in a uh, Kazan picture by John Steinbeck, I'm not the conscience of the world. And Viva Zapata. Uh, it is, but right now, I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough beside the fact that I'm dissecting a piece of cancer that we can look at and put in for, to make a biopsy from. I need some doctors to help me. Uh, I don't know. All I know is I'm making cuts and opening a wound so it can drain, or the sun can get to it, or you can take it out and put it under a microscope and see whether it's cancerous or not. Obviously, it is the cancer of our world, our time, of all our times. And I think somebody much more adequate and better trained than I am can move away from that and to make a prognosis of our sickness. But I detect obviously a note of disillusionment in you and, and I think you've certainly been disillusioned about some of the some of the film companies you, you've had to no, work No, I've for. been disillusioned uh, basically by advertising in but quotes. But you've, you've had trouble with more than just the advertising. I mean, you've had trouble, trouble with nearly all the big studios, haven't you? No, only one thing. Fools. Inadequacy. Stupidity. But it seems to have happened to you rather more than to most people. I mean, you, you had trouble with Major Dundee when they no, but I speak they took up. it away and edited it. I speak, they didn't. One man did. And he told me on the last day of shooting he'd destroy the film of everything that Heston and Mr. Harris and myself would put in. He would take it out. And he did it. And he took two years in doing it. No, that's just a disgraceful form of... You know, people who should not be involved in making pictures. Well, in any case, yes, I was blackballed. I was put down because I talked about people who were dishonest, who cheated, who lied, who stole. And I was blackballed. And, uh, but through that, I came back uh, burnt thinner. And a lot of other people came back a little stronger. And, uh, but the same thing, the same pattern goes once again. Do you not feel, though, that there, there might be some element of, of almost of self-destruction, of masochism um, in everything that's happened to you? Are, are you, as, as somebody once described you, playing the role of the last angry man holding out? <coughs> no, Mr. Uh, Uni playing that. No, I don't think so. I don't have time. Uh, but I do believe, because of my brother and because of my father, my grandfather, I do believe in justice in a man's word. And we must have some form of law. And so when it's broken, I have a tendency to stand up and be counted and fight. What about this um, 
This new film you're making now, that seems to be a new departure for you. It's a, it's a war film called The Cross of Iron. Uh, how is it going to be different from other war films? I have no idea. Well, tell us something about it. What, what, what kind of... What, what is the basic um, idea of the story? It's a story of a German retreat based on a book, The Cross of Iron, by Willy Heinrich. And uh, basically, I felt that it was a story of every common soldier. Presumably, be, being a war film, it's going to have at least its, its share of, of violence. But is it going to be the kind of violence that people, rightly or wrongly, associate with Sam Peckinpah movies? No, actually, it does. I have... I have Deanna Durbin coming in with Shirley Temple <laughs> as German soldiers, and they do a little number and uh, some good German war songs. Uh, it's very exciting. That doesn't uh, sound like violence. That's more like sadism. No, 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 it's not. It's only... If you watch it, it's... It, uh, it's a good... It's a good film. Cross of Iron, which Peckinpah made in Yugoslavia and is now dubbing here at Elstree, is set on the German Eastern Front in 1943. The cast in this story of the disintegration of the German Reich is headed by Maximilian Schell, James Coburn and James Mason. It's due for release next February. I think you've said that uh, if anybody after seeing this film is still for war, it's entirely their own fault. So it, there are, it's going to be a shocker in, in that sense? No. No, we're always going to be for war. Any human being. I've talked to so many people in the United States and in England and in Germany and everywhere and Mexico and Puerto Ros that are only calculate their lives on what time they spent during the heightened emotions of war defending their territory. Isn't How it? many people that you can talk to and you tell me that relate to the Battle of Britain as their finest hour? No, you yes, don't true. know how to, to cope with peace unless Liverpool is going to take on Arsenal again and then we become into the, the Roman games. Well, that can be a war, too, any, a football it's match. It's beautiful, but it is a war. But it is a form of aggression that we can... You know, sublimate, but why don't we have wars in five acres between countries where they we can all watch? <laughs> and the people, because there are people who really want to make war and be soldiers and be tested and die, fine. Let's do that, but let's not kill any more kids and drop bombs and say this is for God, for Jesus. That's a bunch of shit. Going back to, to The Cross of Iron, did you have any particular problems making that film? No. There are absolutely no problems. That sounds incredible. No, it's... Cross of Iron was the finest, the best organized... It was impeccable. Outside of... No film, no uniforms, dysentery from the food. Do you literally mean you had no film? I... There were uh, possibly a, a, a minor mistake or two. I uh, have to check my records and my lawyer's files on that. I see. Yes. It doesn't sound as if it was an entirely happy business making it. No, oh, it's, uh, it's been a delight for all of us. We have three suicides, four nervous breakdowns, and uh, but everybody's feeling rather well about it. Now, I enjoyed making the film thoroughly. Thoroughly. Um, where do you go from here, though? What, what, what do, you ne do you do next? Well, I'm, I'm thinking very seriously about that. I think that I should go to either a psychiatrist or uh, a gynecologist <laughs> who might recommend me to some of his patients. Uh, I'm going to do convoy. 
That, I believe, is with British money, isn't it? Yes. But filmed in America? Correct. And uh, a story of what? It's based on the song, the fine script. It looks like a great cast, which I don't want to discuss right now. But I'm very happy and looking forward to it. I think it's going to make uh, the people involved in it are very high on it. So am I. What about your more indeterminate future? How do you how do you see your career progressing from now on? Are you going to make more movies? Do you want yes. to make more movies? Yes, I do. I have five left in me, I think. Do you I know what they are? I love working. Are, are they... Well, I would like to work with a man who understands the human predicament much better than I can. My father once said, always surround yourself with people who know more. So I have Mr. Sturt Dahlstrom is here now, and we're working on... Is the Swedish novelist? We're working on, yes, uh, on a film I think can possibly be my best. I have the Cousins film to do and a Max Evans film to do and uh, two others. Do, do you also still take the, the, the rather humble view you once expressed that uh, when you said, I'm a good whore, I go where I'm kicked? Let me tell you something about being a good whore. The difference between a good whore and a bad whore is very simple. One makes you think that's important that you stay alive, and the other makes you think that you wasted your money. I'm a good whore. I've been taught by experts. Sam, thank you very much. Don't stop. Wish we could carry on. As I say, BBC coffee never looks so good. <laughs>